Um, okay, so uh, before we start, does anybody have any questions about anything? Yeah, what was the answer to number three? What was the answer? Okay. Um, so three is referring to the talking book scene in Equiano's narrative. So if we turn to uh, page 108, all right? This actually is not, not a bad place to start talking about Equiano. This is actually an important thing. Right, he, said, he writes, I had often seen my master and Dick employed in reading and I had a great curiosity to talk to the books as I thought they did, and so to learn how all things had a beginning. For that purpose, I have often taken up a book and have talked to it, and then put my ears to it when alone in hopes it would answer me. And I have been very much concerned when I found it remained silent. So let's pick apart what's going on in this scene, right? So what is what is the young Equiano, or what did he seem to believe the white people he knew were doing with books? Talking to them. Yeah, they were talking to them somehow, right? So he understood that it's something to do with language, right? And the important thing to note here is the change in tense halfway through, right? When he is talking about his master and Dick, is he talking about, is he talking in past tense or present tense? Yeah, when he's talking about observing them, right? He's talking about them in the past. And then when he starts talking about himself, is he talking in past or present tense? Yeah, there's a shift to present tense here, right? actually I think really important. What do we know must be true about Equiano in relation to books and language if he has written an autobiography? He must know how to read and write, right? Yeah. So the notion of his literacy at this point in his life There's no question here. In fact, you know, that there's an insistence even in the title on Equiano's own authorship of the text, right? From the, you know, this is the interesting narrative of Olauda Equiano or Gustavus Vasa the African written by himself. Other 18th century autobiographies don't include written by himself in the title. So it's clear that this is something that Equiano wants to draw particular attention to. Right, the notion of himself as author, as writer. And yet, when he picks up the book and tries to listen, it still doesn't speak to him, right? So <clears throat> let's just sit with this idea and see if we can come around to an answer to this conundrum by the end of the class period, right? Why does the book still not talk to him? Um, <clears throat> I usually like to start uh, by talking a little bit about Equiano's self-presentation um, as author, because it's a very important part of the way the narrative is, is and was received. Um, I thought we weren't going to be able to do this because uh, when I got to work today, uh, there was no internet uh, in this building. Uh, apparently, our old and outdated equipment had just burned out over the weekend. So, 
Um, this was uh, especially inconvenient as uh, there's currently uh, no power or internet in my house either because Georgia Power is working on the lines on the street. So, good times. Mm -hmm. But then while you guys were taking the quiz, suddenly the internet came back on. So, we are able to do this the way I'd originally intended. Now, this is uh, what's called the frontispiece of the first edition of Equiano's interesting narrative. Uh, do you guys know what a frontispiece is in a book? Cover. It's not the cover, um, but it's one of the first things you see when you open the book, right? So um, the frontispiece, uh, we don't really do this much anymore in publishing, but in 18th century and 19th century books in particular, um, the frontispiece, which would be a, a, like about the first printed page in the book, would include the title, the author's name, and often a portrait of the author. Right? Excuse me a moment. <clears throat> so this is Equiano's author portrait. And just sit and observe it for a minute and tell me what you notice about it. How does he present himself to the reader? He looks European. Okay, what, what makes you say he looks European, Jamal? Um, soft face, uh, it's kind of like a, not necessarily a hint of blush, but like you can tell that, you know, they're thinking about blush. Um, seems like, like the hair, and that doesn't really seem like his actual hair. Okay, yeah, his hair is cut in a European style, okay. He's cold. He doesn't look like he's late. Uh-huh. Yeah, his clothes make him look like a moderately prosperous gentleman, right? Yeah, even like his fans. Yeah. The way he holds. And he's holding the book. And he's holding the book. He's got, you know, his, his great coat and his frilly cravat and his waistcoat, and he's holding a book. Um, you can't really see which book he's holding here, right? what, what it is he's got it open to. Um, but yeah, he's holding a Bible. It's open to the Acts of the Apostles. And his thumb is meant to be uh, marking the passage uh, that talks about the uh, conversion of the Ethiopian uh, early in that particular book. So what does that then tell us about his self-presentation here? <clears throat> kind of makes it seem like he'd been converted. Yeah, he's presenting himself as European and as Christian, right? And as I said, like the idea of self-presentation is vital to Equiano's entire project. Um, he was he undertook probably the first major book tour um, in English literary history, and you know this is in the late 18th century. So you know he sold his book mostly through what was called subscription. Um, you know, people who heard about the book could order it from the publisher um, and have a copy sent to them. Um, and to promote the book, he went all over England uh, giving readings. Why do you think it might have been particularly important for Equiano to go and personally meet people who might be interested in his, in his book, to present himself to the public in a way authors usually didn't at the time? As like the first, I guess, former slave to be a, like an author? He's not the first, but he's close to it. 
Um, there are a couple of slave autobiographies published in late 18th century Britain. Uh, most, I, I think two out of the three are by former sailors, like Equiano. Um, but the issue that he's trying to deflect here is questions about his authorship. Right, so when his book first came out, when most of these kinds of books usually came out, it was often argued by opponents of the abolitionists that white abolitionists were simply putting words into the mouths of former slaves. That one of Equiano's white abolitionist friends had actually written his book and was claiming that it was the narrative of a former slave, when it was all fiction. So Equiano's book tour, the title written by himself, and even his presentation here as assimilated European Christian, are all part of this larger project to convince an audience that no, like this is my work, right? I wrote this. Thomas Clarkson and Granville Sharp didn't write this for me. Now we remember a little bit about Clarkson uh, from last time, right? That Clarkson uh, was the fellow who wrote that imaginary dialogue between an African and, a, and an Englishman, right? So you know we we know that Clarkson had no particular qualms about putting words into the mouths of <clears throat> Africans. Uh, but Equiano, much of Equiano's correspondence survives as well. And so one of the things that makes this autobiography important is that it is uh, circulated and promoted very much within that public sphere that we've been talking about, right? Right. Not only is it sold through subscription, but right, he promotes it through public lectures and forms relationships both with abolitionists and working class activists through letter writing. Now Equiano was also a member of a group of prominent black Britons called the Sons of Africa. And the Sons of Africa uh, were um, a kind of political pressure group um, that advocated um, against the slave trade um, and for the rights of black British subjects. Um, another member of this group was Ignatius Sancho, whose music I was playing um, as you were taking the quiz. So Equiano is heavily involved in particular projects, um, both through the abolitionist movement and through the Sons of Africa. For example, uh, you remember we mentioned Granville Sharp last time. Uh, Sharp was a Gloucester-based abolitionist um, who had uh, formed uh, an idea that he was going to repatriate black British subjects uh, by sending them to sort of start their own colony in Sierra Leone. 
And Equiano was chosen to head up this um, repatriation mission. Um, it failed, in part because most of the people they wanted to return to Sierra Leone weren't actually from Sierra Leone, right? Um, and there were some issues with uh, the way Sharp and some of his uh, lieutenants actually handled the money for the project, right? But <clears throat> Equiano himself was well known enough and popular enough to have been chosen as uh, the kind of spokesperson for this, right? Uh, so what do you guys think of his narrative overall? Like, apart from this talking book episode, which we'll, get, which we'll come back around to, uh, was there anything else that jumped out at you here? When I first read I was like, why? What's that? When I first read I was just like, why? <laughs> okay, why? What, what, what said whitewash to you? Like, I don't, it, I can't really explain it, but you could just sort of tell that mm -hmm. he's trying to be European. Like, I wasn't sure if it's like, he had to, I mean, well, yeah, he had to, but it's like, uh -huh. was he doing this? so that his work would be taken seriously? Was he doing uh -huh. this because he felt like this was the right thing to do? Couldn't actually really tell which one was. Yeah, he's walking a kind of difficult tightrope here, right? Um, on the one hand, he has to build sympathy in a European audience without alienating them, right? But he also has to make them kind of like alive and awake to the horrors that enslaved people endure. So. Oftentimes, he will say something that sounds nice about white people or about Europeans, right? And then he'll often undercut it with an example that points out the opposite. So, to give you an example of this, if we look at the sold again chapter, we go to page 110. When his longtime master, uh, the ship's captain, Michael Pascal, is uh, taking him to be sold again to another ship, uh, about halfway down the page, he says, the boat's crew, who pulled against their will, became quite faint different times and would have gone ashore, but he would not let them. Some of them strove then to cheer me and told me he could not sell me and that they would stand by me, which revived me a little. And I still entertained hopes, for as they pulled along, he asked some vessels to receive me, but they could not. So the crew of the boat says they'll stand by him when Pascal tries to sell him, right? But do they? Nope. There's another instance when he's um, being taken to England where the ship's crew tell him, oh, we're taking you back to your home, right? when, of course, they have no such intention. So oftentimes when he mentions the kindness or support he gets or that he got from white people, it is often undercut then by what they didn't do for him, right? By what they didn't do to help him. Was there anything else that uh, suggested whitewash to you, uh, Jamal, or to anybody else? Of the mother washing a girl's face. Yeah. He tries to wash his face and he's like, oh, never gonna do that same thing. Yeah. Um, on page, you're looking at the top of page 109, right? All right? When we arrived at Guernsey, my master placed me to board and lodge with one of his mates who had a wife and family there. And some months afterward, he went to England and left me in care of this mate, together with my friend Dick. This mate had a little daughter, about aged, five, uh, aged about five or six years, with whom I mo used to be much delighted. I had often observed that when her mother washed her face, it looked very rosy. But when she washed mine, it did not look so. I therefore tried oftentimes myself, if I could not, by washing, make my face of the same color as my little playmate Mary, but it was all in vain. And now I began to be mortified at the difference in our complexions. So what does this passage suggest he's coming to understand? That like Mary's complexion is good and his is like bad. Yeah, that Mary is little Mary is treated differently 
because of her complexion than he is, right? This comes at the end of the long passage about the things he notices that are different in England, right? And in the way English people treat each other. Right, and then the way they treat people who look like him. Right, you know, for example, you know, he says on page 108, um, you know, after, you know, he's uh, been in a church, he says, from what I could understand by him of this God, and in seeing that these white people did not sell one another as we did, I was much pleased. And in this I thought that they were much happier than we Africans. I was astonished at the wisdom of the white people and all things I saw, but was amazed that they're not sacrificing or making any offerings and eating with unwashed hands and touching the dead. I likewise could not help remarking the particular slenderness of their women, which at first I did not like. I thought they were not so modest and shamefaced as the African women. So he's becoming conscious here of difference, right? They don't behave with each other the way they behave with people like me. They also don't do a lot of the things that my people, like see, he's actually bothered by the fact they don't do a lot of these things that, uh, he, like he said, for example, my people don't eat with unclean hands, right? But these people do. So the, com the comparisons aren't always positive ones. Like he said, you know, some of the habits of the English are dirty. Now, one thing to note as well is like about how old is he when he's uh, when this is happening to him? You know, when he is. Like twelve. Yeah, he's only he's only about twelve years old, right? So he's still a child when he, these reflections are occurring to him. And of course, it's perfectly natural for a child to want to be treated like everyone else, right? and to try to you know, behave in ways that will ensure that kind of treatment. So <laughs> he's less conscious here, perhaps, of genuine, like he's becoming conscious of the injustice in the way that he's treated, but is trying to um, allay it primarily by satisfying the people he thinks he needs to make happy, right? Can you just kind of like, he lost his childlike innocence at this moment. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, I think you know, one could say, like, we, we're, we're only given a small excerpt from the narrative, right? You know, the, the innocence is lost, really, kind of the moment he's taken uh, from his village. Um, but, yeah, he's becoming more and more conscious of, like, as he learns more about the English, right? He's becoming more aware of and more conscious of particular cultural practices. Uh, what else did you guys notice about this particular, um, like, did you notice anything weird about, uh, for example, uh, naming? What's going on with names here? What they want. Yeah, um, it doesn't matter what he wants to be called, right? Um, we have, you know, this moment where he's purchased by the ship's captain, uh, Michael Henry Pascal, um, who decides that his new name is going to be Gustavus Vasa, right? This was a fairly common thing that slave owners did. They often ironically gave um, their slaves the names of famous heroes from mythology or history or of, uh, you know, in particular, famous revolutionaries, right? Uh, people would name their slaves uh, they'd name them Napoleon or Caesar or Hercules or Samson or things like that, right? And in this case, Pascal reinforces the naming, right, with violence. If he uses the name, he wants Equiano to respond to, and he doesn't respond to it, he hits him, right? We see this again when this same master decides to sell him to another ship's captain, right? He doesn't let him get any of his stuff. He makes him leave all of his possessions on board the ship and uh, drives him at the point of a sword into the boat where he's taken to another captain and sold, right? So 
any apparent kindness shown to him by this particular captain is always undercut by the threat of violence, right? <clears throat> and this is one of the interesting things, again, about the title, right? We've got the interesting narrative of Olauda Equiano, which most biographers of Equiano note is a name that he did not use until he wrote this book. The name that he typically used was the slave name that was given to him, Gustavus Vasa. And in fact, Gustavus Vasa was the name he continued to use um, in his personal life. It was his legal name um, as, a, as a free British subject. So one thing that we have in the title is the reclamation of his older birth name. The interesting narrative of Ola Uda Equiano or Gustavus Vasa the African written by himself. So when he declares himself as author, he reverts back to his birth name. And Ola Uda, in the Igbo language of what is now southern Nigeria, Ola Uda means loud voiced. So it seems an appropriate choice uh, for someone who wants to you know, become an author and speaker on behalf of a people. So <clears throat> one thing that I would like to do is look a little bit more closely at um, the actual literary construction of his text and how he is using typical 18th century tropes um, to get certain points across to an audience. So can we look on page 106 here? Um, he's he's uh, talking about his first experience um, on the Virginia plantation. Okay. Two important things to note here. Um, while I was in this plantation, the gentleman, to whom I supposed the estate belonged, being unwell, I was one day sent for to his dwelling house to fan him. When I came into the room where he was, I was very much affrighted at some things I saw, and the more so as I had seen a black woman slave as I came through the house, who was cooking the dinner, and the poor creature was cruelly loaded with various kinds of iron machines. She had one particularly on her head, which locked her mouth so fast that she could scarcely speak and could not eat or drink. I was much astonished and shocked at this contrivance, which I afterwards learned was called the iron muzzle. So what's the iron muzzle designed to do? More importantly, even than eating. Yeah, the iron muzzle is intended to enforce silence, right? So this is part of that broader discourse of speech that runs through the whole narrative, right? That the slave is silenced, right? Is not given the right to speak. <clears throat> Soon after, I had a fan put into my hand to fan the gentleman while he slept. And so I did indeed with great fear. While he was fast asleep, I indulged myself a great deal in looking about the room, which to me appeared very fine and curious. The first object that engaged my attention was a watch, which hung on the chimney and was going. I was quite surprised at the noise it made, and was afraid it would tell the gentleman anything I might do amiss. And when I immediately after observed a picture hanging in the room, which appeared constantly to look at me, I was still more affrighted, having never seen such things as these before. At one time, I thought it must be something relative to magic. And not seeing it move, I thought it might be some way the whites had to keep their great men when they died and offer them libation as we used to do to our friendly spirits. So what are the objects in the room here that freak him out? The watch. 
Yeah, a watch and a portrait, right? And why do they freak him out? What's so upsetting about them? Okay, yeah. The portrait, he thinks, is watching him, right? Like, here's this image of a human, like, this realistic looking image of a human being, right? Staring at him from a canvas. Feeling like it's, you know, watching every move that he makes. But what else is, like, why would he think that the portrait might be watching him? While that dude's asleep. What were you saying? To make sure he does his job right. Okay, so on the one, it feels like surveillance, right? Like, yeah, like, like some kind of magic object that's put there to keep an eye on him. But why doesn't he know that it's not? Oh, he's never seen him. Exactly. That's part of the point here, right? To someone who has never seen these things before, they seem like magic and they seem frightening, right? So what he is doing is taking objects that his sophisticated European readers would be intimately familiar with, right? Objects which would be perfectly normal to them, right? A watch and a portrait, and defamiliarizing them. Right, so what we mean by this right, is he's putting the reader in the position of someone unfamiliar with the objects he describes, right? So while these might be everyday objects for a late 18th century European, they are not everyday objects to him. And so he wants to get across to his readers like what these look like to someone who's never seen them before, right? You know, similar thing is going on when uh, you know he is up on the decks in uh, spring uh, 1757 on page 107. One morning, when I got up on the deck, I saw it all covered over with snow that fell overnight. As I had never seen anything of the kind before, I thought it was salt. And so I immediately ran down to the mate and desired him, as well as I could, to come and see how somebody in the night had thrown salt all over the deck. He, knowing what it was, desired me to bring some of it down to him. Accordingly, I took a handful of it, which I found very cold indeed. And when I brought it to him, he desired me to taste it. I did so, and I was surprised beyond measure. I then asked him what it was. He told me it was snow, but I could not in any wise understand him. He asked me if we had no such thing in my country, and I told him no. I then asked him the use of it and who made it. So what does he think this snow is? Yeah, to him it looks like salt, right? Here's this white stuff, this white powdery stuff that somebody threw all over the deck. He's never seen it before. What is this wonderful substance, right? So this is going to be a fairly common technique in Romanticism. But it's very much influenced by these notions of sensibility and sentiment. That we've already noted in a lot of late 18th century literature, right? Because essentially, like, by defamiliarizing these kinds of objects, how is Equiano trying to bring the reader around to his point of view? What is he trying to get you to do? Yeah. He's trying to draw he's trying to draw on the reader's sympathy, right? By helping the reader to imagine 
what the world looks like to someone in his situation, right? So let's kind of come back around to the talking book and then um, <clears throat> look at Mary Prince, who is, uh, whose own uh, work comes about, uh, about 40 years after Equianos. Um, so in light of what we've been discussing here, how do we read this talking book passage now? Right? The idea that he takes up the book, he tries to listen to it, but it still doesn't speak to him. We know he knows what a book is for, right? And that it doesn't literally talk. Why does the book not speak to him? Absolutely, it is absolutely a metaphor, right? That the book of the Europeans, right? However hard he tries to assimilate, however hard he tries to wash his face, right? Doesn't talk to him because it doesn't speak to his experience. And you know, we can see here that he is. Um, like Clarkson in the conversation, in the imaginary conversation with the African, right? He's talking a lot about Christianity, and well, he is, you know, has adopted and presents himself as an English Christian. He also doesn't mind noting the hypocrisy he sees in these uh, <clears throat> other Christians that he encounters, right? Like uh, Captain Pascal. Right, and, you know, on page 110, he talks about you know, the, the Christian lessons that Pascal taught him. Right? Always treated me with the greatest kindness and reposed in me an unbounded confidence. He even paid attention to my morals and would never suffer me to deceive him or tell lies, of which he used to tell me the consequences, and that if I did so, God would not love me, so that from all this tenderness, I had never once to, uh, supposed in all my dreams of freedom that he would think of detaining me any longer than I wish. So he pointedly tells Equiano that it's a sin to lie, right? It's a sin to deceive. And then what does he go and do in the very next paragraph? Yeah. He forces him to, then he forces him into a boat and sells him, right? So what he's pointing out here is the hypocrisy of all of this moral instruction that he's receiving. That no matter what he does, no matter what he learns, no matter what he tries, right, the book stays quiet. The book still doesn't talk to him. So let's move on while we still have uh, time here to the Mary Prince. Uh, now Prince, as I said, um, was born around the time Equiano's book was published. So she's you know, um, you know, more than a generation younger than he is. Um, and Prince herself, unlike Equiano, was illiterate. Right. <clears throat> So her autobiography is told to uh, someone who's taking down her thought, like essentially you know, taking down her dictation, right? So what did you notice about Prince's uh, description of her experiences, and how do they differ uh, from Equiano's, if at all? Hers was been on the line, like she thoroughly described the experiences that she went through, and like she even goes to call out um, people who say that people want to be slaves, 
those uh-huh. things. Yeah, Equiano, like as we noted, is a little indirect sometimes, right? This is more so hers is like yeah. straight up in your face. Yeah, she is not making any efforts um, to uh, to downplay or to make subtle any of what she experienced, right? So while Equiano was trying to engage your sympathy, right? Prince seems to be trying to excite instead your outrage and your horror. So there is a different strategy at work here. And I think that some of this might have to do again with when these two works were published, right? So Equiano published in 1789. In 1789, the slave trade was still fully legal. in all British dominions. In fact, like, um, well, I guess by 1783, uh, the United States are independent. But one thing that um, we often forget when we talk about American history is that, at least initially, um, slavery was legal in all 13 colonies. Right? We often have this misconception that slavery was illegal in the North and legal only in the South. That's not true. Slavery, slavery was legal in New Hampshire until 1856. It was legal in New Jersey until the 1830s. Uh, my own home state of Pennsylvania, I believe it was finally outlawed in 1809, right? So while abolition, well, 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 slavery was made illegal earlier in many of the Northern colonies, it was still legal for most of the early history of the United States, right, throughout. In fact, the only colony in which slavery was initially illegal was Georgia, because it was founded as a debtor's colony, and General Oglethorpe didn't like the idea of people who were coming here to pay off their debts having someone else do the work. And then once he died, of course, the law was changed and slavery became fully legal here. But yeah, so 1789, when Equiano was writing, the slave trade was fully legal. Now, Prince's uh, story is published in 1831. Now, do we remember the date when the slave trade was abolished in British Dominions? It was somewhere before the 1810s. Mm. Yes, very good, Nick. Yes, 1807 was the year in which the slave trade was abolished. And there was then supposed to be a gradual process of um, you know, freedom awarded to slaves in British dominions. Well, wasn't it still like slavery without the term slavery? It was more like apprenticeships? Yeah, the apprenticeship laws, um, uh, which um, held people on the plantations where they used to work uh, where they used to be slaves uh, for fixed terms, right? Uh, and of course, since Mary Prince is pointing this out in 1831, right, we can see that in 1831, this is still a problem. Right, so the 1807 abolition remains unfulfilled. So Equion, both of them are working with white abolitionists as well. But they're working at very different stages of this abolition movement, right? Equiano is writing to argue for legal abolition at a time before it's happened. Mary Prince is writing at a time after technically legal abolition has occurred, but the West Indian planters still haven't let people go. And so 
if there's a greater sense of frustration and anger in her work than in Equiano's, um, yeah, I think that you know that a lot of that is quite understandable given the different historical circumstances, right? The other thing to note as well is that um, Equiano served mostly on a ship, um, and I'm not saying this to downplay the horrors of slavery for anyone, right? But usually, slaves who served on ships got somewhat better treatment than slaves who served on farms on land, in large part because on a ship everybody did the same work. Um, however, I want to point to the work of a French anthropologist by the name of Claude Mayassou. who makes a distinction between what he calls the condition and the state of slavery. I think I've spelled his name correctly. I'm never sure. So for Maya Su, the condition of slavery refers to The treatment of the enslaved person, right? Are they treated humanely? Are they fed enough? Are they not beaten? Uh, so on and so forth, right? The state of slavery refers to the slave's legal status as property. And what Maya Sue argues is that people often confuse the two, right? That people will often argue that if slaves were treated humanely, well, then it couldn't have been that bad, right? But what matters here is this state, right? And that's the big part of Maya Sue's argument, is that what we need to focus on is the state of slavery, the status of a person as unfree. And this is the thing that however he's treated, Equiano was always keenly aware of, right? Is his the legal gap that separates him from free Englishmen. And it is this legal gap that allows Mary Prince, uh, or the people who own Mary Prince, to treat her as a piece of property um, in her narrative, right? Now, I don't want to, um, I don't want to dig too closely into this because the descriptions of the way she's treated on the plantation are pretty horrific, right? And <clears throat> I think, you know, the, uh, the idea here, like at the beginning of this passage, the injuries inflicted on her in the course of her daily work um, you know, digging up salt are then quite similar to the injuries inflicted on her uh, by her master when he is upset or enraged, right? That, you know, whether <coughs> working or being punished, the central, um, the central motif of the experience um, is unfairly inflicted pain. And then the second part of this is kind of much more focused on emotional pain, right, than physical pain. Right, she writes, I still live in the hope that God will find a way to give me my liberty and give me back to my husband. I endeavor to keep down my fretting and to leave all to him, for he knows what is good for me better than I know myself. Yet I must confess, I find it a hard and heavy task to do so. So like Equiano, she's trying to find consolation in religion and not always finding it, right? I am often much vexed, and I feel great sorrow when I hear some people in this country say that the slaves do not need better usage and do not want to be free. 
They believe the foreign people, right, that is the West Indian planters, who deceive them and say slaves are happy. I say not so. How can slaves be happy when they have the halter around their neck and the whip upon their back and are disgraced and thought no more of than beasts and are separated from their mothers and husbands and children and sisters just as cattle are sold and separated? Is it happiness for a driver in the field to take down his wife or sister or child and strip them and whip them in such a disgraceful manner? Women that have had children exposed in the open field to shame. There is no modesty or decency shown by the owner to his slaves. Men, women, and children are exposed alike. Since I have been here, I have often wondered how English people can go out into the West Indies. They forget God and all feeling of shame. Or uh, how can go and act in such a beastly manner. But when they go to the West Indies, they forget God and all feeling of shame, I think, since they can see and do such things. So what's the move she's making that's similar to what Clarkson was doing in his imaginary conversation? Talking about how mainland Britain doesn't really see all these things happening they're not there. Yeah. That the people who go out to the West Indies are British, right? They're people from mainland England, but somehow they don't see these things, they don't pay attention to these things when they are in England, right? Is it because they're being ignorant or they generally just can't see like what's going on? Um, the general suggestion I think that Prince makes and that Clarkson made and that Samuel Taylor Coleridge made uh, would be that this is willful ignorance. Right? You know, Coleridge's arguments for the sugar boycott, right? It's like, you know, look at that little jam pot on your table, right? You know where the sugar that sweetened that came from. You know what's required to produce that. And yet, you buy it anyway, right? So. <clears throat> Yeah, there is an attempt, I think, yeah, kind of to kind of indict the larger British public for simply overlooking the problem, ignoring the issue, right? Which seems to be of a piece which, with much uh, late 18th and early 19th abolitionist writing. Um, so whether or not it was a result of genuine ignorance, the abolitionist writers definitely regard it as willful ignorance, right? Um, what other questions do you guys have for this, since we are running short on time here? Yeah, Aaron. Um, top of 122. Um, uh -huh. When she says, uh, well, one second. she says, uh, they hire servants in England. If they don't like them, <clears throat> then they'll send them away. They can't like them. Is that, she's just saying lick as in like whip. whip. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah well, right, what, what she's saying is that, yeah, people work as servants in England. Don't give a fuck. But yeah, they, yeah, yeah, you're not allowed to beat a servant. Yeah. And um, you also, um, like, servants can quit. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I really like how she drew a contrast between indentured servitude, which is like a choice. Yeah. Versus slavery, which is forced. Yeah. Um, Absolutely, yeah, even though the work that's being done is often the same. And then like towards the end, like, mm -hmm. she, like her syntax changes, like she starts using shorter sentences, like when she says, this is slavery, like that's the whole sentence, that was just really powerful to me. Uh-huh. Other questions you guys have? So I do also want to just take a second, and then I'll give you the reading questions for Wordsworth for next time, but I just want to take a second as well to note that everything we've been looking up to, uh, at up to this point has also been connected to the techniques that were commonly employed in the Gothic novel, right? That Equiano, to a lesser extent, and Mary Prince, to a greater extent, are both um, attempting to horrify and frighten the audience, right? Um, you know, <clears throat> Equiano is using that portrait 
to much the same effect Horace Walpole was in the Castle of Toronto, though he is using it to make an actual political argument, whereas uh, for Walpole it was just atmosphere, right? You know, Mary Prince is using descriptions of actual physical horrors to try to drink, bring home to people how awful the system is. Um, so, readers at the time would have been accustomed to these tropes from consuming Gothic novels. All right, so I'm going to give you the reading questions for next time. We're going to be reading one of William Wordsworth's many, many, many poems about himself. Two ninety nine to three hundred two. Two ninety nine to three hundred two. Yeah, it's poetry, so it's going to be a little bit more dense. So take your time with it. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, it is a much smaller reading than you are accustomed to for this class.